Hi hey everyone, uh, my name is Hassan. Uh, still surviving, huh? Tired already? Okay, I'm gonna be easy on you. <laughs> I will also talk about social networks, just like uh, Steve did. Um, Steve talked about the, uh, how the uh, connectivity networks, the patterns of connections, uh, might reveal some insight into how uh, infectious disease spread on those networks. Uh, but I'll be more on the uh, general uh, networks. I'll show you some uh, example networks, some uh, studies on, uh, on networks for uh, epidemiological or public health purposes. And also, I'll show you a few examples of uh, uh, our group studies on uh, parallel to this. I, the title is Contagion in Social Networks. And by, by contagion, we, don't, we do not only mean the uh, contagion of an infectious agent, a virus, or something else, but also everything else related to uh, infectious disease might be spreading on the uh, social network. For example, your sentiments, your ideas, your uh, thoughts about anything might be affecting your neighbors, your friends, right? And they might be affecting others, etc. So everything uh, else is also a contagion in the network. It might be spreading from person to person. And sometimes, uh, not local connections, but an overall uh, agent in the network might be uh, in effect. For example, media or the uh, government. Do you trust government? Do you trust CDC, etc.? Those questions might also be answered in the same framework. So it's a very rich uh, framework because it's a very simple framework. A network is just a collection of points and connect, uh, collection of points and connections. So if you have points and if you just connect them by lines, you have a network. Could be anything. Could be friendship network where you have the individuals as nodes, right, the points, and the connections are friendship. Or if it's uh, if you are studying uh, influenza spread, the connections sh could be uh, the uh, the contacts uh, between the individuals that will give you a chance to study the infectious uh, influenza uh, spread on the network. So it's a very simple uh, framework. That's why you can use it in many other areas as well. Okay. Luck. <laughs> All right, great. So I'll, I'll start with a very simple, small experiment done by Jacob Moreno years ago in 1930s, actually. Later, later he's, he published this in uh, 1960 in his book. A very simple experiment. So you go, he actually went to a, a dormitory, a girls' dormitory in a school, and he asked uh, students about their friendship, about their friendship in a specific uh, context uh, in a dining table. He asked them who they dine with. And he only uh, gave them two choices. Your number one choice for uh, dining together, a friend, and number second choice, okay? And then at the end, what he did is he put all this into a network, right? Where we have individuals, all these uh, girls, just they know to buy circles, as we do in many other network studies. And the connections between them are labeled connections, just tells, uh, tell us that Cora's number one choice for a, uh, for dinner is Ada, and her second choice is Jean, right? And when you get together all this data into this uh, network framework, even just by looking at this visualization without any uh, quantitative analysis, you can see some patterns there. You can answer some questions. This is a directed network, right? I'm saying uh, I'm Cora. I'm saying Jean is my second choice, but Jean didn't say I was her second choice or first choice, right? So there's a direction uh, in the connections. Now, this might answer the question, who is the most popular girl? <laughs> who is the most popular girl? Mary. Who? Marion, right? And Iwa. Uh, who else? Edna. Edna, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So this is what we call in degree, meaning connections to me from others. If I have a high de in degree, if I have a high number of income connections, that increases my popularity. If many uh, people choose me, I'm one of the most popular in the uh, network, right? That's something we can answer by using this network visualization. We don't even have to have the count, actually. And what else? Uh, since this is a direct network, we can talk about whether the uh, connections are reciprocal or not. If I choose a person, and if that person chooses me, right, that's a good thing because that means we have a 
stronger connection than others. Now, there are some girls, they have chosen two other girls, but nobody has chosen them. A little bit unlucky. I'm not saying they are, the, uh, they are losers, but <laughs> since, because the, Jacob Moroni asked them to name on the two friends. Maybe uh, some other girls have chosen Ella, but she's not the top two. She's maybe uh, the third, fourth, etc. That's why she lost it there, but definitely I'm not saying they are losers. All right, El Ella, Irene, for example, uh, and Ruth, anybody else? Please. Nobody has chosen them? Alice, Laura. Laura, yeah. All these can be just easily answered by looking at the visualization, right? Mm -hmm. Without any quantitative analysis. Another thing, maybe it's harder to see, is look at this group. Ruth, Betty, Hilda, Hazel, and Irene. They've chosen some other, they've chosen uh, people in their group. They also chosen, chosen others from the larger network, but nobody else in the, uh, this part of the network have chosen them. Right? So they form an isolated group. It's important to know, to, uh, to know uh, the number and the size of those groups because if you are setting spread of anything on this network, if it's just in one uh, sub-network, it might stay, stay there for a while before it jumps into another. And if you have this a lot, the, uh, the my disease might get stuck in those little locations. And you have to know the statistics of those uh, sub-networks. All right. This is just uh, an undirected version. If I'm just talking about contact, it's always usual, mutual, right? If I have a contact with a person, that person should have a contact with me. It's not like the friendship direction. OK. And for this is actually a better network to study inf infectious diseases. Now, I have all these connections. If it starts somewhere, let's say Maxine was sick, and she didn't know she was sick, because just before the symptoms, she uh, came to the dormitory, and then who are the most, uh, who are the people who are in most danger? People around them, right? Uh, Maxine has, uh, I, I will assume that their friendship with, the, with these girls is good, so she will have more contact with these girls, so these girls are in danger. And subsequently, all other connections to these girls are also in danger, maybe to a lesser extent. Right? These are something you can answer by using the network framework. Just, I'm gonna show you some pictures now. I think really, uh, see. Human brain. This is maybe the most complex network we ever see. It's too complex. Why? How many neurons do we have in our brain? Over? Hundred billion. We have, on average, hundred billion neurons. And do you know how many connections each neuron, on average, has? Ten thousand. 10,000 connections for, uh, on average for each neuron. It's an immense network. I can't even put this into my computer. Not even in my supercomputer. Super we have a supercomputer center in Pittsburgh, and the largest memory we have is 16 terabytes. It's amazing if you know what I mean, but <laughs> we can't even put this into that uh, supercomputer. No way. Maybe this is the most complex network. If we have the tools and uh, resources to analyze, would be a really ideal to analyze. And actually, I'm just giving you a link here uh, for an NIH-funded project, a huge project, $30 million project, a uh, human connection project for, to a multi-institution consortium. OK, this is another, uh, these are another kinds of networks we uh, sometimes we study. Uh, what is this? What does it look like to you? It's a network of? Airports. All these nodes, you remember, points are airports, and lines are connections, the flights between them, right? Now, this network is quite different by just looking at it from the, this another spatial network. This is a network of? I'm sorry? Roads, highways. Not old roads, just highways, right? All these cities are nodes, and the connections are main highways. Now, these two networks are actually in Apparently spatial, right? There's a space dimension. But from a network point of view, they are really different from each other. Why? Because if I want to go from Los Angeles to uh, Boston, what do I do? Just take a flight. It's a direct flight from Los Angeles to Boston. I'm there, right? Just one step, one half. But if I want to go from Los Angeles to Boston, uh, if I'm, if I'm going to drive, 
I have to go through all those cities, but it doesn't make sense. No transportation system in the world will make a road, would build a road from Los Angeles to Boston without stopping anywhere else. It doesn't make sense, right? So this inherent uh, limitation on the uh, uh, connections create two different networks. This is what we call a scale-free network, where we have a power law of degree distribution. If you look at the histogram of the number of connections, you'll see that some nodes will have very high degrees. They are called halves. We have halves, for example, here. Just It's easy to see them. Chicago is a hub. Lots of flights to other cities, right? What else? Uh, New York. Uh, I think Washington is one of them. And Atlanta and all other big cities have airports. But the uh, highway network is very different. It's more closer to a random network. If you just randomly uh, draw uh, connections between uh, randomly uh, uh, to the points uh, in the network, this is what you get. So they are very different. Also, in terms of any dynamics on those, they will behave very differently. OK, this is a network you might know. This is a Facebook network. So all these uh, dots, white dots, are individuals. And the connections between them are these uh, blue lines. Right? So this just tells you how many uh, People are connected to Facebook in different parts of the world. You see, Europe is really wide, and also you know, North America is very wide, even in other cities. And some developing countries have a lot of Facebook users. It's, it's very popular. Those areas. And some people actually uh, started using Facebook and Twitter data to, uh, for epidemiological purposes, for people's sentiments towards vaccination, etc., like uh, stuff like that from their tweets or from their connections. All right, now I'm not a big user of Facebook, but this is a nice application. Now this is called Friendville. I guess I'm at the center, so my connections, my first degree connections are all my friends, right? My connections to all of them have been deleted from this so that it will look better. This just tells you the connections among your different communities. Now I have very different communities. I work in different states, uh, in different cities, different uh, universities. So I have all, in each, I have a different network. All those networks are very well connected to each other, which we call them communities, right? But the connections between the communities are not that high. This is also something important to know in social networks. This is an online social network. It really doesn't make any sense to uh, study any epidemic dynamics on this, but you can study other types of contagion. You can uh, study the, the fads, the uh, gossips, how they uh, spread in this network. It's possible because it's just communication, right? Now, I have a better picture from uh, LinkedIn. Right now, it's more visible. Uh, my, the uh, communities I belong to. Now I'm at the center, so I have all these connections to all these guys, and the color code tells me, I wrote this by the way, color code, uh, is easy to see? I worked at the Los Angeles National Lab, uh, where Sarah and uh, Steve worked, and I have some connections from there. <laughs> and then I have RPI connections where I got my degree, or all Lanel is here, I think. No, this is Pitt, sorry. I also uh, worked in Pitt, and I worked in uh, Los Alamos National Lab, uh, my university, all uh, create subgroups in the network. They are not isolated. Apparently, I have uh, connections between the communities, just people who have been to both places or both cities, etc. But all this reveals a community structure around me. I, have diff I belong to different communities. There are connections between the communities. That also tells me about clustering, how I cluster my neighborhood. In social networks, for example, uh, people tend to introduce their friends to each other. That increases clustering. Clustering means the probability of your neighbors have connections among each other. And that's, from an epidemiological point of view, it's very dangerous. Human social networks are very densely connected. Just taking some nodes out of the network won't uh, uh, contain any disease there. The very well connected social uh, structure doesn't allow you, just by taking some notes, you cannot really stop a disease. It's more difficult, really difficult. Why is that? OK, this is another network uh, from a different study. Uh, this is a high school contact network. This group gave uh, sensor devices to each student in a high school, about 800 students. During the day, from early morning till uh, evening, they carried all uh, those devices on their necks. And at the end of the day, they looked at the uh, contact network. Those devices can record their, each other's IDs when they are clo in close proximity, such as three meters, uh, the distance for the uh, influenza. And from this, at the end, what you get is a social network, a social contact network. And you can set up this network to answer some questions. For example, what happens if this guy is sick? this red circle. How fast that person can make other people sick 
in uh, his or her initial neighborhood, first degree neighborhood, and they will also infect others and others. So we can answer some questions by using the social content. Right now we are doing a, a similar study in a larger scale uh, in, in Pittsburgh. Actually, uh, Derek is also here is the uh, co-pain in their project. We are uh, using the same uh, mode, the uh, wireless sensor mode. At the same time, we are uh, using the uh, surveys, the administer surveys on students, ask them about their contacts, and we'll combine this to get a better picture of uh, contact network in that, so that we can study special influenza. All right, this is another uh, network I've uh, been working on, uh, college student smoking network. Now all these uh, nodes are students and their connections are directed connections, just like friendship connections among them. Now there are periphery nodes, those are the nodes with less centrality, we call them periphery because nobody has chosen them, because they are actually not in the network. When you ask uh, somebody about their friends, for example, just right here, if I ask you about friends, you will tell me some friends, maybe from here, with low probability, uh, but also you will have friends in other locations, right? All these uh, guys actually are out of the network. Now, I, it's possible to just delete all of them and look at the overall structure in the, uh, all the respondents in the survey. I can get a clear picture of social network as well as we have the information about how they perceive their friends' smoking behavior. My, I don't smoke, I smoke and my friend doesn't like me smoking. That's also the information we have for two different uh, uh, snapshots, we are studying the, uh, how smoking, uh, the prevalence of smoking in the social network. As I mentioned, if we have two snapshots, so it's easy uh, to answer, uh, as has been done in previous studies, that smoking behavior, how does this change the network structure? Or how does the network structure change smoking? That's something you can ask, just like Eric mentioned, that what is the code, what is the effect? It's sometimes not easy to say. There is an association for sure, but answering questions like how does the smoking behavior change the network structure is something we can answer by using this network. And the preliminary result shows that the, uh, the coreness, the eigenvalue centrality, which is uh, a measure of how you are in the core of the network and you are at the periphery, the uh, coreness of the smokers decreased in time. Right? They are pushed at the periphery, just like has been uh, shown in the previous studies. Okay, now, what about public health? I'm gonna show you a transmission network where we uh, follow people. Uh, let's say you have a patient came to the clinic and you are the attending uh, infectious disease uh, clinician. And uh, you have been notified that that person has died in the hospital. And because of some contagious disease, you don't know what it is. Now, what do you do? Find out who they came to CDC. Good, first you call CDC. And then they help you, <laughs> actually they do it for you. So they find and they try to find the immediate connections of this person because it's important to find the uh, ground zero patient, right? Where, does it, where did it start? It? So now they found out that the, her son has also been uh, in fact infected and actually he also died. And also she went to Hong Kong, that's where it started. In Hong Kong, she went to a, uh, a casino. In the gambling table, she had a close contact with a gambler from Japan, right? And that person also died in Japan. And she also had a connection with a grinning girl in the bar. Uh, she touched her cell phone because she forgot her, her cell phone in the uh, table. That's another uh, contagion there. That person also died. And another friend of uh, hers in Chicago died. Uh, Vader died in the casino. Vader's sister died, and Emma's friend's wife died, everybody. Also, the Ukrainian girls had a, a touch with another person, he also died. Does that look familiar? What is it? It's, it's Contagion, the movie. <laughs> that Emma is the uh, I'm not gonna, I don't want to spoil the end of the movie, but it's not that important, so I'll, I'll show it to you. It started with bat. That bat eaten the, uh, piece of banana, and that banana went to a swine, swine ate it, and it was sick, and then cook soldered that animal, and then Amov wanted to congratulate the cook because the meal was good, and when they touch each other, here you go, you have contagion, all right? So it's important to know the structure of this room. And we, these are not the old nodes we have. Now we have a lot of people here, her son's uh, daycare, a lot of students there, and Vader went to his uh, apartment. He had contact with a lot of people there. And this Ukrainian girl, actually Barnes was in a bus. He touched everywhere, and other people touched those places. So a lot of people were also infected. From this study, from this kind of data, you can estimate 
a very important parameter, which is? Are not. Are not. Yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, now we have another network. How, how many minutes do I have? 10. OK. OK. All right. This is a network from a study, a sociological study uh, by Birman and all. And this is a dating network. So they asked the students who they dated with. And uh, blue are males, and uh, pink circles are females. This is a very interesting structure. This is much different than the adult dating network or adult sexual uh, network. Now, first of all, this is different. If, you, if I ask you, were you ever told in high school not to date your ex-boyfriend's current boyfriend's ex-boyfriend? <laughs> no, you are not, but you didn't, right? And in mathematics, in graph theory, this is a cycle. Now, four people form a cycle. Me, my ex-girlfriend, her current boyfriend, and her boyfriend's current uh, ex-girlfriend. If I date that person, that would be a cycle of four. We don't have a cycle four here. Definitely, by just looking at it, I can tell there are some individuals important in terms of any uh, study of STD on this. For example, this guy, <laughs> the little partners, or this girl, a little partners. By the way, this is for an 18 months. They are not concurrent, not at the same time. <laughs> the past 18 months, they have these. Uh, they they have, they dated these uh, these persons. This is mostly a heterosexual uh, network. Uh, I think there is one thing right there. But again, it's uh, mostly uh, heterosexual. This is not the whole network. It's just part of a huge network. Just this is the one I showed you before. All these were also present in that network. We have a lot of these uh, little structure. We call them components. They are isolated from the uh, rest of the network. And we also have lots of guys, couples. They didn't date anybody else in the last 18 months. And we have these, nine of them, two boys and a girl, and 12, two girls and one boy. So the studying the structure will give you some insight about the uh, STD, because it's a dating network uh, spread on the uh, network. As I said, this is very different than adult dating network. This is how it looks like. This is from a Colorado study by Potter et al. And they uh, registered the uh, gonor gonorrhea and uh, chlamydia uh, cases uh, in hospitals in, uh, in that county. And they also asked about their uh, sexual relationships with other people. And this is what you get. Adults don't really care. They don't have that norm. So if you want to uh, come up with some intervention methods, they have to be different in adult network and high school network because the structure is very different. All right? OK, I'll go to a, we have a large scale simulation system in Pittsburgh. We call it FRED. First the name uh, came, FRED, and then we found a name for it, a framework for destruction of epidemiological dynamics. It's a large scale simulation, and it's not that uh, a simple piece of code. It has about, I think, 30,000 lines of code, so it's quite complicated. It incorporates the uh, population data from the uh, US Census Bureau. So we know in each state in the US where people live, where they go to work, if they are students, where they go to school. Right? And by using all these, we create some dynamics on it. We uh, let people go to different locations and uh, have contact with others. So if they are sick, they will make other people sick, right? with some probability, of course. And we, uh, this uh, model is also, uh, it's also possible to put uh, some intervention data. For example, you have uh, X amount of vaccine. How do you distribute it? That also be, uh, uh, can be used as a uh, parameter in the model. And at the end, what you get is just uh, some curves, that number of cases uh, in your state or in your city. It's also possible to get uh, visualizations out of this. And also, different diseases can be uh, simulated by using the same framework. Uh, we, uh, this uh, simulation uses the SEIR model. We have also an exposed uh, state there. You get the virus or uh, bacteria, right? But you are not infectious. For influenza, either one or two days, and after that, after the latent period, you become infectious. I'm sorry, after the uh, latent period, you become infectious. And then you will get into this box. But the problem here, because we have two types of uh, infectious, symptomatic and asymptomatic. About one third of influenza cases are asymptomatic. They don't feel sick, they don't have fever, they don't cough, 
but they go to school, they go to work, they infect other people. They are less infectious than uh, symptomatic cases, but it's also important to, uh, to model them. They are kind of responsible for many uh, weird behavior in your uh, simulation. All right, here I'm just uh, showing you the uh, timelines for a, for an, uh, for a person. Uh, we can talk about two different uh, lines. One is a medical status, so it starts with incubation. After we uh, uh, are infected, uh, after a certain time, it's called the incubation period, you develop symptoms right here, right? But this is different than the infection status. After infection, you become exposed. After a latent period, you become infectious. But this period is exposed or latent is usually shorter than incubation. For influenza, for about 12 to 24 hours, you are infectious, but you don't have symptoms. That's different than being asymptomatic or symptomatic. That's also important to uh, uh, use in your, in your model because it's an important uh, part of your simulation to uh, come up with uh, correct results. Now here, uh, it's just a typical curve. This is actually plague uh, that uh, in Bombay, Mumbai, in 1908 or nine, something like that. The uh, circles are data, and the uh, curve is actually a fit. Uh, by using a uh, second hyperbolic function from SIR model. Now, we know that this increase is always exponential. And do you know how exponential is bad? Just take a piece of paper, a large piece of paper, fold it into two, and then again two, and again two, again two. If you do that 50 times, how thick the paper would be? Kilometer? 100 kilometers? 100 million kilometers. Almost the same as the distance between sun and earth. That exponential is really bad. That's what I'm trying to say. Still doing the calculation? It's 2 to the 50. If you have a paper like this, and it's, if it's possible. Anyway, uh, just I'll, thank you. I'll show you two uh, slides for the uh, FRED uh, results, uh, our simulation results for school closures. Now, people are interested. The, uh, the kids, uh, school age children, are most of the time responsible to uh, infect other people, right? I have two daughters. Whenever I'm sick, I know that before me, my daughter was sick. And she brought it from daycare or she brought it from school. Most of the time. All right. What happens if I close down schools? And how long should I close to contain the disease, to contain influenza? Now, here are different curves of case, number of cases. Uh, for a period of uh, maybe 200 days, and so the x axis is days. Now, the blue curve is the uh, baseline scenario. You don't do anything. You don't close down the schools. And our simulations, actually, the default parameter is 50% of the time people stay home when they are sick. 50% go to school because they have to sometimes. They don't have sick leave, et cetera. We're also studying that. And if you close down the schools, if you know that there's an epidemic in the city, which is, by the way, Elgin County, or no, I'm sorry, this is Pennsylvania, the whole state. Now, you know that there's a disease, an influenza uh, pandemic uh, in the state, and you close down the schools after one week. This is the, uh, the red curve. And if you uh, close, I'm sorry, red curve is just right here. So this is a little bit of, uh, better in terms of number of cases if you just close down all schools for one week. What about if you close them for two weeks, for three weeks, for uh, six weeks? It doesn't really matter only when you really close on schools for a longer period, like eight weeks, that creates a difference. That uh, decreases all these number of cases right here. Again, you have a bump here. After eight days, students come back to the school, but the disease is not finished yet. Still, some susceptibles in the uh, student population will be sick in, in those times. That's why they have, you have this little peak here. But it's important to know how many cases you can save by closing down the schools. I'm not even asking, can you close down the schools? That's a legal thing. Actually, we have a legal team analyzing all the state codes and uh, legislature. Can you close down the school? And who has the responsibility? Who has the uh, ability to close down the school? Is it the governor? Is the school of, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, department uh, health, of health? Or the individual school districts? That's also important to know. But here, the whole state uh, follow the same. OK, another uh, slide uh, results uh, for the uh, school closure. Right now, we have a, a threshold. Now, all schools are closed if they have one case, one confirmed case of influenza. If they see one student sick in the school, they close on for about four weeks, I think. It, I think it's four weeks. And blue, again, is the uh, default curve that if you don't do anything, this is what you get, number of cases. Uh, in 60 days, it, becomes, uh, it reaches the uh, peak. And if you close down schools, in just, if you see one case, 
for about four weeks. It looks like you are doing really great, right? It's much lower than the uh, default scenario, but when they come back, still you have the epidemic going on in the city, uh, in, in cities and in the whole state, and when they come back, still we will have steppable students. That's why you will have this peak. It will just pushing the, uh, the peak. That's kind of OK, because in the meantime, it might be possible to uh, develop a vaccine for that specific strain if it's a pandemic. All right? Now, there's only one more thing I'd like to uh, say about network-induced. I just coined this term, stability. Now, I have a network, which is the elegant encounter network, about 1.2 million people. And I just randomly infect 100 people in the network and then let the disease run, right? After about 150 days, uh, the disease is gone, right? But what I got at the end is the, uh, the attack rate, which is the number of people who have been sick in that simulation. Now, if I do this 1,000 times, and each time if I infect 100 different people, because I randomly uh, select them, at the end, if I look at the how many times out of these 1,000 runs you were sick in the population, that will give me an analysis of how susceptible you are, not because of biological you, it's because of the, uh, your location in the network. This, does it happen all the time to uh, elderly people? Did the disease get to them in time? Or it's the younger people? And this is what I got. This is the distribution of the infection ratio. So out of these 1,000 rhymes, times, how many times that person, individual, was sick? And I got the how many people uh, do I, I have uh, having that uh, infection ratio. This is actually typical. I'll have a binomial distribution, kind of. There will be some people who barely got sick because they don't have much mobility. They stay in uh, closed locations. They don't work, et cetera. So they won't be sick all the time. And there are some people who, have, who will be sick uh, at all the time. But this is interesting. About 15% of the population becomes sick more than 80% 80 80 of the time. So whenever you start the disease, the virus will find those people. Who are they? Any guess? Children. Children. School age children. All right? If I just, uh, we are looking at many other things, many, uh, doing many network measurements, but if you just look at the age, so here, x-axis is the age, and y-axis is the average infection ratio uh, having that age. Now, children before school have about 50%. So out of this 1,000 runs, 50% of them, they were sick. They have been infected. If they go to school, this is what you get. Wherever you start the disease, it will go to schools. It will infect almost all the students, and all those students will go to their homes, and they will infect their families. All right? And it will drop here. And another bump here for all these different states and Elgin County. Why do I have this bump here? They are the parents of those children, right? And again, it uh, decreases. And here we have the uh, retired people who don't go to too many places. So they, their uh, average infection ratio is not that high. But, but they are the most vulnerable population with the uh, younger kids. Because when they are sick, when they get sick, the complications is much worse than uh, younger generation, younger people. All right? That's it. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Sure. And I just have a general question about the difference between pandemic, epidemic, and endemic. I know there's different between all of those terms, but I can't keep them straight in my head. I was just wondering if you'd be able to clarify. Okay. Thank you. So pandemic, epidemic, and endemic. Endemic is a state of a disease in a society, in a population, that it's always there. It's, it never ends. That's endemic. So we have some cases of some specific disease all the time. They are not that many, but it doesn't die. We have every year 100 cases of a special disease. I don't want to give an example now. That's called endemic. It stays there, doesn't die. An epidemic, an epidemic is just uh, in part of the uh, network or in part of a place or in a city, you have uh, you a disease start, for example, influenza, right? It uh, infects a lot of people, and then at the end, it will die, right? And it will start again in the next year, in the season. The difference between pandemic and epidemic is pandemic is much worse than epidemic. Pandemic, if I'm just talking about in R-NOT language, usually R-NOT is higher in pandemics. 
it infects much more people than any epidemic. That's why we call this 2010 pandemic, because it's infected a lot of people than other usual uh, seasonal influenza. That's some that's word we use for uh, really uh, uh, worse diseases, pandemic. I think your presentation would be a great way to promote homeschooling, by the way. Um, OK. <laughs> keep kids out of school. Um, Actually, my wife is from School of Education. She also mentioned the same thing. <laughs> but um, how generalizable are these models? Uh, I see that they vary by age, but what about other factors? Well, apart from those details, we believe it's the case in everywhere. We use different uh, data from different states. Uh, census-based data, and they all have, uh, they all show a stable uh, picture, and which is pretty much the same. Of course, there are going to be, uh, there are details that, uh, interventions, you might have different interventions at the same time, we just talked about school closure, but at the same time, if you are also uh, adding some other measure, something else, some other intervention, the whole picture will change. So we, what we usually do is, if I have lots of parameters, I try to fix all of them except one to see the overall effect. But if I just uh, make two of them active, they might have also an interaction that makes things complicated. But for a simpler picture, we can say it's kind of robust. It's something we uh, see in all those 